And joining me to talk about this is Don Drummond, economist at Queen's University in Ontario and the former chief economist at TD Bank. Don, thanks for your time tonight. What's your big picture take on the budget? Does it deliver on what the country needs and keep some guardrails in place? No, I don't like to see these endless deficits. Uh, it's very interesting. They set their own benchmark, which is a high deficit and high debt. And success is defined in the budget as not any worse than we predicted it would be. So we had these high deficits and high debt in the fall economic statement. And I wanted to see them bring down to the budget. And they're quite content to leave them where they are. In fact, the deficit is even higher in the outer years in this than it was before. They had some good fortune in a sense, a higher projected nominal size of the economy, higher revenues that could have been used to bring down the deficit, but still we got billions of dollars of new spending instead of doing that. Do you put any stock in the in the down the line look that says the deficit will be cut in half by 27, 28? Well, I guess I go even before that. Why do we have deficits? Uh, we're operating at a fairly high level of activity. For sure, the unemployment rate has inched up a little bit lately, but it's at a pretty much the lowest levels has been since the survey started way back in 1976. We have a Bank of Canada in agreement with the government trying desperately to get back to 2% inflation and fighting that. I would argue we shouldn't be having deficits right now at all. And a debt to P ratio of 40% is very high. And having it go down from 40% to 39.1% is not a remarkable achievement. And as you indicated, uh, there's concern about the size of the public debt charges. They're consuming almost 12 cents of every revenue dollar. That's money that's not available for health care and social programs and defense and, and the rest of it. Where would you like to see that ratio at? I'd like to at least get back to what it was prior to the pandemic in the low 30 percent. Uh, there's no reason why there should have been a permanent increase. That did require extraordinary action. The economy proved to be relatively resistant in many instances of that. Some of those programs have come back, but not all of them. And we're going to seemingly permanently run a higher level of debt. I think at that low 30% we were before throughout the 2010s, that's put us in a good position and allowed the country to respond to the financial crisis and the ensuing recession in the late 2000s. It allowed us to deal with the pandemic. It was, we were very fortunate we had that lower debt P ratio when this struck in late February and March of 2020. We won't be so lucky if another shock, an economic downturn or some other crisis hits us with this much higher debt level. We just won't have the flexibility. Some sort of wealth tax, of course, was expected in the budget. We got instead a capital gains tax, essentially. A better option than a wider wealth tax? I didn't like the wealth tax because we already tax the income and then we tax the savings on that income. So wealth, in many respects, is a, a three-way tax. If we don't think we tax uh, higher income earners enough, we should do it in the first instance. But higher income earners pay over 50% of their income uh, in taxes. It's already very high. I'm very skeptical of these very large numbers that they're going to get from the capital gains. A lot of people just will defer the, the, the realization of them and they'll sit there as paper gains without tax. I think we're going to get some wild stock market activities in the days leading up to this uh, being implemented. I think that implementation of it is a very rough start for that increase. And I have to remember when we increase this inclusion rate, we don't allow for any adjustment on inflation. So if you bought an asset 20 years ago and you're now selling it, almost all the taxation is on the inflation gain. It's not on the real gain. And in a very rough way, this half inclusion rate was to compensate for that. So now we'll go back for some to a three quarters rate, but again, not recognizing the effect of inflation. Should they have gone the other way with more cuts? So we're going to not fill some vacancies. I think 5,000 positions there. They're going to reduce workspace, federal workspace, office space. Should they have looked at more cuts as a way to balance this? Absolutely. You can see that they never really had an appetite for these internal spending reductions. And whatever they did have, they lost. Uh, talk about anticlimactic. At the end of the first phase, there's a statement in the main estimates, February 29th of this year, that if you want to see the results of the departmental savings that have been identified, you have to look in a thousand page document under each department. It's not even added up anywhere. Presumably, there's not a very compelling story. And then there was reference, well, don't forget, there's a second phase, but we find out in the budget, the second phase is just some of the people who are departing and retiring, we won't fill them. That's it. No exhaustive look at programs. Is this program no longer needed? Is it not working very well? If so, we should fix it or maybe eliminate it or cut it. 
none of that. They don't want to do that. They just pile the new spending on top of what's already there. So the term the finance minister is using in this budget is generational fairness, giving a hand essentially to millennials and Gen Z uh, in many different ways, education costs, housing, of course. In your mind, does this budget succeed in doing that? As a rare occasion, I'm very jealous of editorial cartoonists because I think this is a wonderful opportunity. On the one hand, it's saying to young people is making things more affordable today, but it is doing it by borrowing against them in the future. Who's going to pay this debt? Of course, it's the young people that are going to pay this debt. I'm not going to end up paying that much of it. They're going to pay that much of it. They're carrying this 40% debt. And by the way, almost all the resources are going to be devoted to adaptation to climate change. Uh, try tackling that when you're carrying a 40% debt to be ratio. So it seems to be a bit of a laugh line that this is helping young people. This is saddling young people with a lot of debt. On housing, does it deliver? Is there part of that multi-level housing announcement that, that you like, you think will work well? I think there's no doubt the country, and I emphasize the country, the federal government, the provincial governments and municipal governments to a degree have woken up on the housing crises and the lack of access and the high prices um, a little bit late and still not doing it. You still see a lot of resistance to higher density. Uh, we, we have to get past that. And we have capped the number of immigrants and we brought down the number of temporary, temporary foreign workers. But you know, a good part of this is we had the largest percentage increase in Canada's population in 2023 since 1956. And those were very special circumstances. That was a refugee uh, from Hungary and other Eastern European countries and the height of the baby boom generation. I haven't seen anything like that since that, but we saw it in 2023. That's the main reason why the housing prices are up. So we need to deal with that supply side for sure, but we see some need to see some mitigation on the demand side as well. It's going to take a while for these measures to play up, and I don't think we're going to see housing prices come down anytime soon. Don Jamin, got to leave it there with you, sir. But thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye.